Welcome to Sabbath School. I'm Pastor Cameron DeVazier. And I'm Pastor Mark Howard. This is Sabbath School for March 28, 2020, the very last lesson in the first quarter of this year. And I don't know about you, Pastor Mark, but I have been enjoying the study of the book of Daniel. Oh, absolutely. Yes, and this week we're coming to the very conclusion, Daniel chapter 12, a lot of exciting themes and ideas in there. But as much as we are excited to get into the lesson study, we have to remember there's more to Sabbath School than just the Bible study and prayer. That foundation is always there, but we also need to focus on mission. So right now we're going to show the mission spotlight for this Sabbath from the Inter-European Division. People in the church many times don't understand what I'm talking about. This is the biggest challenge for me. How I can be part of the world as a salt, what Jesus said, you have to be salt, and uh, to be close with God. This is my challenge for me and for my family, to be very close by God and to be close with the people outside. Mostly I am working with not Christian people. Pastor Jan lives in Košice, Slovakia. His passion is working with people who don't know about Jesus' love for them, especially the Roma community. Many people will not associate with the Roma and find ways to keep their distance. Years of cultural differences have created a barrier between the ethnic groups in the region, but Jan feels called to reach out anyway. He often organizes activities with the Pathfinder Club and outings for underprivileged children and youth. If you are working with the children, you can, you can uh, touch uh, parents' hearts. If I am uh, good for children, parents are happy as well. Pastor Jan works in the outskirts of Košice, among the Roma community. With each visit, he brings gifts. These simple presents open the doors and show them that he cares about them. The Roma have challenging lives. In this house, seven families live together. One of the mothers is a Seventh-day Adventist, and she teaches the children stories from the Bible. Pastor Jan stops here to greet his friends and bring a word of encouragement. Before leaving, the group takes a picture together to remember this special moment. Meet Monica. From a young age, she really wanted to participate in activities with the Pathfinders. But she faced a lot of challenges with her family because they believed the Adventists would not be a good influence in her life. Pastor Jan taught Monica important truths from the Bible. He also helped her find strength to succeed despite her family's opposition and the scarce opportunities in her community. Today, Monica is an example to others in her village. She is well-educated, having graduated from university, and serves as an educational coordinator at her town's community center. Monica was a very special person. She was like a miracle, because she wanted, knew about Jesus everything. She wanted to read Bible properly, and then she started to teach another Bible, I love to see the children coming with joy in their eyes. They can see that I've changed because of Jesus. I am so happy when they say they want to be closer to Jesus and have a story like mine. Monica and her husband now lead three groups of youth and children at the local Adventist church. They hope to disciple others in the community and mend broken relationships so God's church can grow. Please pray for Pastor Jan's and Monica's outreach ministries. This quarter, your 13th Sabbath offering will support this work among vulnerable children in Slovakia and the Czech Republic. It will also build a church with a children's center in Bulgaria and assist Adventist education in Spain and Germany. Thank you for your support of the 13th Sabbath offering. Now that's an exciting report from around the world about global mission. 
But sometimes, Mark, I think we get in trouble. When we talk about mission work, our minds automatically go to right. an idea that it's a missionary mission. is somebody who travels a far distance. Right, to they're going to go a faraway land, jungle right? or some distant land. And our job is only to pay for them and to pray for them, not yeah. actually do it, right? Yeah. Well, I believe the Lord has given us a missionary mandate for our own territory as well. Right. And the Michigan Conference recently sent out their own team of missionaries for a relatively local mission, even though they went 90 miles outside the United States to the island of Cuba. But Pastor Wes Peppers is with us, and he's going to be talking about some of the exciting adventures they had just recently in their mission trip from the Michigan Conference. All right, so we've seen our global emphasis from the World right. Church, also some missionary work happening from right here in Michigan. What can I do? There you go. And there should be every Sabbath in our Sabbath schools, what I like to call a missionary funnel that goes from what they're doing globally to what we're doing locally, but it shouldn't end there. It should end with what am I doing personally That's for the right. Lord. But in this time of social distancing and you know isolating, how can I do personal ministry? Right. Well, the literature department of the Michigan Conference has helped put together in conjunction with the health and temperance department, Sister Vicki Griffin wrote a important glow track called coronavirus and immunity. Now this is well, a... Well you just mentioned uh, go the, ahead. The social distancing. What, yes. Are we supposed to make paper airplanes out of those <laughs> and fly them over to our neighbors? Well or, that is a good a idea. Terrible yeah, idea. Maybe actually. we could wash our like hands, put on attention. gloves, fold up these things <laughs> and throw them at our neighbors. Yeah. Uh, no, but in reality uh, there is still digital evangelism going mm -hmm. on right now. And this happens to be a little pre-order that the hard copy glow track will be available in about two weeks time but right now you can access this same material the same glow track in a digital form for sharing via social media and text messaging and mm -hmm. email so visit the glow homepage and you can begin sharing with your friends your neighbors your co-workers those people on your friend groups in social media about not only some health principles but the spiritual tie to what's going on in the world and help give some guidance to people in these. As exciting as all the mission work is, we don't want to forget that the foundation of Sabbath school is Bible study and prayer. And this week, man, we've got a lesson to cover, oh, don't we? Oh, don't we, yeah. Yeah, so Mark, can you begin us with a word of prayer and then introduce us to the lesson? Sure, let's pray. All right. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the testimony of your word, the testimony of apostles and prophets. And Lord, as we are reviewing the message from the prophet Daniel, we do pray that the Holy Spirit who inspired Daniel and recorded these things on the pages of your word, not for their time, but especially for our time, that the same Holy Spirit would give us understanding as we discuss these things. And Father, may uh, you communicate these things to us, not just in a theoretical way, but in a very practical way mm -hmm. for the times we're living in today. For we ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So this week's lesson. This week's lesson is uh, primarily based on Daniel chapter 12. We've been mm -hmm. working our way through the book of Daniel. And maybe before we dive into the lesson, we give a little bit of an introduction as to what we're doing and why we're doing this. We haven't done this before mm -hmm. as a Sabbath School Personal Ministries That's Department true. here in Michigan. And so... I'm guessing there are people who probably have the question, is this like the new normal now? Right. <laughs> are we going to be doing a Sabbath School program every week from the conference office? And in talking with Pastor Mark, and uh, we've discussed the, you know, there could be benefits in that, but I think there'd be more drawbacks if we were to do that, right? <laughs> right? Not only from having to put it together, but also we want the Sabbath school experience not to be just something you click on online and watch, right. but actually experience in the local church context. But obviously right now we can't meet in local churches. So right. this is a stopgap measure, a temporary program that, right. that will include, like we've already done, the entire mission program and now the Bible study lesson. But don't expect that every week now, Sabbath School is going to be brought to you by the Michigan Conference Sabbath School and Personal Ministries Department as an alternative to the local church. Our department exists to support and enhance, to train, equip, and encourage the local church to have a vibrant, active, living Sabbath That's School right. experience. And one of the reasons for that, and one of the reasons that leads us to this, is during this COVID-19 crisis, we've noticed that a lot of churches have turned online services, mm -hmm. but it's been the online church service. And uh, some have done online Sabbath schools, but 
for many, there, there isn't the Sabbath school option. Mm -hmm. And Sabbath school is the one thing in our church, in fact, I, we were at a convention recently, mm -hmm. and it was highlighted that while you could go to a different Seventh-day Adventist church every Sabbath and hear a different topic from one church to the next, when we get to Sabbath school, the churches around the world are studying the same topic. Yes. And so it's keeping us on, a, on the same page in regard to our understandings of Scripture, and especially now with the topic of Daniel, and then we're rolling into a new quarter where we're talking about the Word of God and how to study the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Very timely and important subjects. We wanted to make sure that you didn't miss out on that during this COVID-19 crisis. And, that and, and you bring up an important point because we just had our mission program, right? right? And we talk about the unity we have for mission. We're one church all around the world, but our, uh, our message is also united, right? We have right. one message our to go. Our mission is giving a message. Exactly, so our mission and our message are, are tied together. Right. You can't separate the two. So it's important that we stay united on that biblical message. And again, talk about relevant. You talk about timely. Daniel chapter 12 is loaded yes. with some important practical stuff. And if you've studied the lesson, which I trust you have. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Uh, in fact, one of the things that we're going to be doing today, and uh, this is not going to be a full-on teaching moment, uh, teaching a seminar, training, but it exactly. is a teaching moment, and yeah. that is that the quarterly is, is not designed to be the basis of study Come for Seventh-day Adventists. Mm. The scripture is the basis for our study, and the quarterly is a guide, but how often do mm -hmm. we come into Sabbath school classes where it's like, okay, now Sunday it says this, and Monday it says <laughs> this, and Tuesday, and the reality is for many classes that I've sat in over the years, and I mean, this is probably 80 or more percent, mm. you get to maybe Tuesday, and it's like, well, there's a lot of good stuff, but we're not going to get to it because we're out of time. Mm, yes. Um, that's one of the drawbacks of making the quarterly the foundation. So mm -hmm. we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 12 and his novel idea. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and we want to draw out what we're seeing there in Scripture. But Daniel chapter 12 is, is one of those chapters where, much like the book of Revelation, where you've heard it said, we've read the, the end of the book and we win. Mm -hmm. Well, Daniel chapter 12 brings us to the final victory mm -hmm. of God's people, of Jesus Christ with his people. And so it's an awesome Amen. chapter, especially in uncertain times like now. So to be clear, we're not saying either study your lesson quarterly no, no, no. or study the Bible, but the purpose of the lesson quarterly is to help clarify and apply those messages that are found in the Bible. That's right. So that's a guide to studying the Bible. In fact, you go to the official page and they don't call it the quarterly anymore. They call it the adult Bible study guide because it's a right. guide to Bible study. And, you know, we both went through the lesson in the quarterly and the contributor did a fantastic, fantastic job. Fantastic job. But we are still going to go to Daniel chapter 12 for our study. So if we take our Bibles, in fact, Daniel 12 is a very short chapter. So we may as well begin by just reading through Daniel chapter 12 and, uh, and then we'll break down different parts of the passage. Okay. Daniel I'm going to start 12. in Daniel chapter 12. And um, uh, why don't we just alternate? I'll read verses 1 through 3. Okay. You can do th 4 through 6. I'll do 7 through 9, and then you take us to the end of the chapter. Okay. Okay. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever." But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on this river bank and the other on that river bank. And one said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, How long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. 
Although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, My Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from that time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. But you go your way till the end, for you shall rest, and you will arise to your inheritance at the end of the days. Now, see, this is such an exciting chapter that I even stole one of your verses. I just couldn't stop That's, reading I had verse no problem nine. At all. I had to go on to number 10. But there's um, so many things to touch on here, aren't isn't there? Isn't it interesting? Yeah. There's 13 verses, but these verses are packed. And if you've never studied Daniel 12 before, I can see somebody saying, whoa, what is the, the man clothed in linen and the time mm -hmm. and times and half a time? And, uh, but don't be discouraged because even Daniel said he didn't understand, right? <laughs> so if we're looking to like leave here completely understanding <laughs> every element, we're probably aiming for off the mark. That's but right. we've got Michael. We've got his standing up. We've got this time of trouble. We've got the deliverance. We've got these time prophecies. Man, this is loaded. That's right. So let's, let's start in chapter 12 okay. with this very first phrase, which is important because we are just coming into the lesson today. We mm -hmm. didn't just read through all the 11, 11 right. other chapters right to now. Um, verse chapter 12 starts with these words, at that time, Michael shall stand up. So it begs the question, at what, what time? time? What are we yeah. talking about? What time are we talking about here? Right. Well, at that time, that is referring back to something, right? Yeah. And so what we've just been studying in our last week's lesson was Daniel chapter 11. And there was a sequence of events outlined in Daniel chapter 11 that culminates here at the beginning of chapter 12. Absolutely. So what is this time, Pastor Mark? Well, it, it, chapter 11, and if you recall last week's, the, you know, I talk about 12 being difficult. <laughs> chapter 11, even for seasoned theologians, yes. is a, a very complex chapter. And yet, at the same time, and the reason it's complex is because the Bible gives very detailed pieces of history, mm -hmm. history to us, they were future for Daniel. But in the midst of that, there are still very clear indicators. Yes. Um, so there, there are some uh, big rocks you look for in the some jar, landmarks. as you often exactly. call them, exactly. uh, where we can see the, the uh, breakup of the Babylonian Empire, the coming in of the Persians, and the moving on, and then we see the rise of the Roman Empire, right. which well, to we be see clear, earlier in Daniel. For instance, if Daniel only consisted of chapter 11 and 12, we'd be certainly confused about That's 11 right. minutes, but it comes after we've already been, the pump has been primed and the, clear, the, the path has been cleared with Daniel chapter 2, and that sequence, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, right? Mm -hmm. Then you had Daniel chapter 7, the same sequence, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Now it's Rome in several phases. We right. get more detail. Then as it goes through, we introduce to the time prophecies that are mentioned here in chapter 12 and chapter 7 and chapter 8. And so when we get to 11, if it was taken out of context, we would just start ascribing this could be this, could, <laughs> but we have to keep it in the framework that God has already given That's us right. in Daniel chapter, the other prophecies of Daniel. Well, and I would encourage those who are studying, don't get lost in the weeds of Daniel mm. 11. Uh, I think the quarterly did a fantastic yes. job of, of breaking down and making clear the high points of Daniel 11. And what we see as we come to the end is, and, and if we, you've studied prophecy at all, you know, comparing this with the book of Revelation, that at the end of time, there's going to be a, a, a joining together of church and state, yes. as we saw in the Dark Ages. And then under that, that uh, attempt, that rulership, there's going to be an attempt to control the world. You know, mm. the world empires, we see the rise and fall all through Daniel. So the last verses of chapter 11 talk about the Antichrist power, mm -hmm. the uniting of church and state in the last days, the same thing we see in the book of Revelation, to try to come together with a, with a one world order, if you will, mm -hmm. for lack of a better expression, to take over uh, and, and compel the world to worship the beast in his image. Exactly. Now, it doesn't mention the beast in his image here by name. We see that in Revelation. But it's at that time where, where you see when you come to to this king of the north is the Antichrist power. Mm -hmm. And when you come to uh, verse 43 of Daniel 11, it says, he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver, over all the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. 
But news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many, and he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. And up to that point, what we see is he's looking like he's going to take away the victory. Mm -hmm. He's going to wipe out every other power, and the Antichrist is come on, going to come off victorious. But then those last few words say, mm -hmm. yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him at that time. This is how right. he comes to his end. So we're coming into verse 12. So it's going to look like the Antichrist power is going to take away the day. And on that point, just for my thinking on this, you go to Revelation chapter 12, yeah. right? And you have the same history. You've got this dragon power that's the Roman power uh, powered by Satan himself, right? Yeah. His, his Antichrist representative. And he's following the church and persecuting it at the very end. Same time prophecy elements are mentioned there, the time, times, and half a time, right? And it says that basically he's trying to take over the whole world, but there's this one group that frustrates him. That's in right. fact, it angers him. It says, and the dragon was enraged with the woman or the church, right? And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. This is exactly what you see in Daniel chapter 11, that he's seemingly right. taken over the world, but there's this one. And why does that one group frustrate him? Because they keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. And they're helping others to do the same. They're proclaiming yes, they have that a message, message, the tidings. tidings from the East. Exactly. That's, that's what we're seeing here. That's exactly what we're seeing. And he doesn't like those tidings from Absolutely the East. Not. Okay, that's preparing the way for the coming of Christ, for the standing up of Michael. So this is the time frame we're looking at when it looks like the Antichrist is going to take away the day and Michael stands up. Let's talk about Michael. Okay. Who's Michael? Easy. <laughs> the long-standing, I believe, correct biblical understanding of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is that Michael is Jesus Christ in right. his role as leader of the angel hosts. And we're going to touch on that, but I want to clarify that this is not unique to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. People, the, the, the critics of, of the Adventist faith, and you may have heard this, will say, uh, my, you guys believe Jesus was an angel. Mm. And uh, Michael, as we're going to see in scripture, is called the archangel or over the angels. It's not saying he's an angel. Right. Um, but regardless how you look at the verbiage, um, just three references. C.H. Spurgeon, the Baptist prince of, prince of preachers, understood Michael to be a reference to Christ. Mm. John Gill, the Baptist commentator, understood Michael to be a reference to Christ. Mm. Matthew Henry, if mm -hmm. there's any commentary that's like anybody who has a Bible accepted. app, it's yeah. like everybody, Matthew, mainline Christian, believes that Michael was a reference to Christ. Right. So, and, and none that of them a, believed he was a created being or an angel. Right. And that's not just opinion and that happens to be popular or <laughs> traditional or out of fashion now. Right. It is based in scripture because you look at every time Michael or the archangel is mentioned. Well, let's look at some. Okay, let's look at a few of those. Let's go to Jude, shall we? Sure. Okay, right next to the book of Revelation is that tiny little sliver of a book. One chapter. <laughs> Jude, yeah, it only has verses, right? But there it speaks about the power that attends this angel being, this archangel, Michael. That's right. It well, in, and, and it's where, the, where he's designated the archangel. As Michael the archangel. Right. Right. Look at verse 9. You want to read that for us, Mark? Sure. Jude chapter 1, which is the only chapter, chapter there, there is, verse yeah. 9. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Now, what I find interesting there is you have Michael, the archangel, designated, like you said, as, right. a, as a single entity, contending with whom? The devil. That's right. Right? Now, in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7, we have that introduction to the great controversy. It says, war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. That's right. And of course, and it says later on that the dragon is the devil and Satan. So now we have two references to Michael, and it's in context of contending with or fighting with Satan. Interestingly enough, this is the power that can defeat Satan. Well, also in that passage in Revelation 12, Michael is fighting the dragon. Mm -hmm. Both are symbolic names. Mm. The dragon is a symbol, and then the Bible goes on to explain That's the this devil, is the Satan. devil and Satan. So you would expect Michael to be a symbol as well. Mm. In other words, and what does the name Michael mean? Who is like God. I mean, who would you give that name to? <laughs> Someone who is like God, yeah. Well, anyway, the Bible calls him here the archangel, Michael the archangel. Now go to 1 Thessalonians. Mm -hmm. um, all the T's in the New Testament are together and they're in alphabetical order. Isn't Handily that handy? Enough, yeah. Don't know if that was intentional, but 
Uh, it wouldn't have been in the Greek, but <laughs> anyway. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And the Bible tells us in the context, we're talking about the coming of Christ. And so we're going to pick up in verse 15. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Now, we were just talking about Moses being asleep mm -hmm. and a resurrection there. That's By the way, I want to like seed yeah. this in. In, in Daniel chapter 12, we're talking about those who are asleep and shall arise. That's right. Every time Michael, the archangel, contends with the devil, A, he wins, and the dead <laughs> come to life. Keep reading. First Thessalonians. Keep going. I'm so excited. Verse 16. <laughs> For the Lord himself yes, sir. will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Now, some translations say the archangel. Right. There's not an... Well, the Bible, the Bible itself is already identified of, as the archangel. That's right. exactly right. With the voice of... The, who has the voice of the archangel? The only... The archangel the Lord himself, himself. The Lord himself, it says, has the voice of the, voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. So when the archangel, when when the Lord speaks, shouts with the voice of an archangel, mm -hmm. the archangel, the dead come to life. Amen. There's one more passage that I think seals the deal here, and that's in John chapter five. Is that where you were going? That's exactly where I'm headed right now. <clears throat> I believe we start in verse 28. Yes. Well, in fact, we could probably, uh, let's start with verse 26. Okay. Well. <laughs> let's start in chapter, uh, exactly, verse exactly. 1. No, 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 we're limited. No, 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 no. Let's, let's start with verse 24. Can I read that one? It says, do it. most assuredly, I say it to you. By the way, this is Jesus himself speaking. That's and right. he's going to be talking about end time events and his own coming. And he says, most assuredly, yeah. as if some other stuff were debu dis debatable, yeah. this is certain. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is uh, when the dead will hear the voice of whom? Mm, the, the Son, Son of, of God. God. And those who hear will what? Live. Live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his, his voice. voice. Now we just saw the Apostle Paul and say, And come forth. And come forth, exactly. And come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. And he starts to get in detail about how the resurrection mm -hmm. process will work. And we'll get into that later. But the point remains that the Apostle Paul, when he says the voice of the archangel, Jesus himself applied that to himself. That is my voice. That's right. So putting together what we've looked at, there are more verses that we could look at. For but sure. These are just a few to try to capture the idea. Mm -hmm. You've got Jude calling Michael the archangel. Mm -hmm. You come to Paul's writings and Paul says that when the Lord himself comes, he's going to shout with the voice of the archangel. Mm -hmm. But John says, and when he shouts with the voice of the archangel, the dead will raise. But John says they're going to hear his voice and the dead will raise, which is the same thing Paul said. He just didn't spell out that That's it's right. the voice of the archangel. Michael, the archangel, one who is like God, is Jesus it's Christ. It's consistent. It's clear. I believe it's inescapably clear that Jesus is Michael. Now there's one, there's one uh, uh, hang up that I understand that people have if we're going through the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 10, when it talks about Michael, Gabriel calls him one of the chief princes. Mm -hmm. And so people will naturally ask, well, wait a minute, if Michael is Jesus, how could he be one? Mm. of the chief princes. And this fits so well with what you just said about Revelation 12. Mm. A lot of people forget that Jesus himself referred to Satan as the prince of this world. Mm. But you're going to see that in scripture, Daniel 10 calls Michael midway, and I forget the verse there in mm -hmm. chapter 10, um, one of the chief princes. But at the end of that chapter, Gabriel tells Daniel, Michael, your, your prince. prince. So there are two chief princes contending one is the prince of Daniel, and one is another prince, the prince of this world, I believe, and that's why we see those two powers contending with each other in Revelation 12. And exactly. It's been that from the very beginning. It's going to be all the way through at the very end, and we know that here and back in Daniel chapter 12, Michael is going to stand up. And Michael's <laughs> going to win this thing. Amen. Amen. 
So let's go back to Daniel chapter 12 yes. and continue on. We've already covered at that time. Uh, this is the time of the, those end time events, right? right? Michael shall stand up. What does that mean that Michael, now that we know who he is, is going to stand up? Well, let's look at a couple things here. And I know you have some comments as well. But this is a continuation again of chapter 11. And when you go back to chapter 11 and you begin with this narrative on the rise and fall of kingdoms, Chapter 11, notice it says in verse um, 2, And now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up. Now I'm reading in the New King James. I'm going to have to highlight some things from the King James Version that will make this clear. The King James says three more kings will stand up mm. in Persia. Verse 3 says, then a mighty king shall arise. King James says, shall stand up. It's the same phraseology. You go to verse 7, I believe. It says, but from a branch of her roots, one shall arise, literally stand up. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. Daniel 11 has already used this phrase to talk about when somebody is coming into power, coming into their yes. kingdom. Yes. And so we're, keep in mind that we're continuing this narrative as we come into chapter 12. We're finishing up. Daniel tell them, we didn't mention this, but, but you know, in Daniel you have, you know, the vision of Daniel chapter 2. You have the vision of Daniel chapter 7. When you come to Daniel 8, Daniel 8 and 9 go together. And then Daniel chapters 10 through 12 are a whole package. And as we're coming into chapter 12, we're, we're finishing off chapter 11. But that same language is being used. This king stands up, this king stands up, this king stands up. Now we come to Daniel chapter 12 and Michael stands up. And that goes again with the sequence of the prophecies that were already given in Daniel. You saw that with Nebuchadnezzar when he got the very first one That's in right. chapter two. You're the head of gold, but after you another kingdom shall arise, That's and after right. you another one, and then another one. But the very last one will be God's eternal kingdom That's that's exactly set up. So right. we have a sequence of ruling powers. But what we see in chapter 12 now is after the worldly powers, we're gonna have the true king of all heaven and earth stand up in his place Amen. to rule. Absolutely. Now, another thing that comes to my mind in this passage is the significance of um, in, if you go back to Daniel, not Daniel, but the book of Acts. Of mm. course, we, we looked at in Daniel already the time prophecy where God gave the Jewish nation a probation of 70 prophetic weeks, yes. 490 years. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that time in the book of Acts, Stephen, uh, one of the first deacons, is preaching to the Jewish Sanhedrin. And the Spirit of God comes upon him and, and he says, you circumcise in heart and ears, you know, yeah. this powerful message. And they stopped their ears. They ran at yes. him in unity. In one accord, the in Bible one accord. says. <laughs> and then uh, to stone him to death. Mm -hmm. But Stephen, the Bible says, lifted his eyes to heaven and he said he saw the Son of God standing yes. at the right hand. Now, other references in Scripture to Christ say he went and he seated himself at the right hand of the Father. So when Stephen points out his standing, there's a significance. That probationary period for the Jews had come to its close. Right. And then Michael stood up. Do you notice that in, in all of this, because we understand the heavenly sanctuary to be an outline of Christ's ministry, his That's entire right. ministry of our redemption. Praise That's the right. Lord. And it actually begins out in the camp where he's the lamb that was raised without spot or blemish. And then he transitions into the courtyard to take on his public ministry, which would end in death on the cross. And then he transitions to the heavenly work, which Stephen attested to when he could see Jesus yes. standing, yes. right? But there's another transition from the holy place to the most holy That's place. Right. But at each one of those transitions, Christ stands and is pointed out as, for instance, whenever he began his public ministry. On, from the transition from the camp to the courtyard. He stands up at his baptism and the Holy Spirit endorses him and anoints him with, you know, and the, John the Baptist says, this, behold, the Lamb of God, there he stands. Stephen right. could look into heaven and say, they're standing Jesus even now. And what I believe Daniel is outlining in chapter 12 is another transition in the ministry. It's a seamless, continuous ministry, but it comes in phases, right? That's right. So here we're coming to an important transition in the ministry of Christ for our redemption and Michael stands up. That's right. And as you said, and we've been looking at Stephen, that, that when Stephen saw Christ standing, it was, a, it was the close of probation for the Jewish nation. Yes. I believe this is marking the close of probation for the human race. In other words, mm. Christ is not going to be a high priest for eternity. Mm. 
uh, you know, and some people will say, well, he ever lives to make intercession. And so, but that isn't to be taken that he's always going to be a high priest. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter nine, that the time is coming when he will have put away sin and then he's going to come again. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he doesn't come as a priest. He, he comes, comes as, as king. king of kings yes. and Lord of lords. And this goes along with this, the other kings standing up and coming into their kingdoms. Mm -hmm. And time permitting, we could go into prophecies where, you know, Daniel 7 talks about the Son of Man coming to the Ancient of Days to receive for himself a kingdom. a kingdom. Now it's interesting, and we've discussed this before, how Christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary right now is establishing that kingdom, That's right. but he's doing it through the work of judgment. That's he's, right. he's, he's deliberating every, the verdict of every case, who's gonna be the citizenry of right. his kingdom. He's gonna make up Right, what, who's ki what, make up the what kingdom? kingdom what, what good is a kingdom with nobody in it? <laughs> That's right. That's why there's books, right? There's right. The, the books, the Lamb's Book of Life, who's going to be written in that book. So on paper, he's collecting the citizens of his kingdom. But at some point, when that work is done, he will stand up That's and right. put off those priestly garments and come to execute that judgment and actually collect those and make his kingdom in a literal sense, not just on the paper, but in person. That's right. And this seems to be a transition of where Christ is completing his work of judgment and transitioning to his work of king. That's right. This is, in, he's preparing to come. Yes, indeed. It's just incredible. Like not preparing to come in, 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 you know, years. That's right. This is, he's preparing to come and probation is closing. And you'll see the significance of that as we get into these next few verses. Which I don't want to interject here. Well, I do. In fact, I'm going to interject. You are here. interjecting. <laughs> I want to interject here. <laughs> but you remember what we already studied about the identity of Michael? Yes. In John chapter 5, what was Jesus talking about? He was talking about the end time events That's exactly where he right. would be coming to That's resurrect exactly the dead. Right. In 1 Thessalonians, when it makes reference to Jesus himself with the voice of the archangel, it's when he comes again to resurrect the dead. And what do you see here in Revelation? I mean, in Daniel chapter 12, the same thing again. You know, it's just dawned on me that we're still in verse one, so we need to move <laughs> along. Um, it says, well, we can't, we're not actually moving along. In fact, there's a, most of the setting is set up is in verse one. Ugh. The very next thing it tells us is, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. Now, I know that as a Seventh-day Adventist, a lot of Seventh-day Adventists have concerned themselves with the time of trouble. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure it's not just Seventh-day Adventists, as I've read. People worry about the end of time. And, and, and of course, we're in the midst of this COVID crisis. Well, it's and a heightened expectation yeah, and now. What, yeah. what's going to come next and, and the uncertainty and everything. And so there's something, and I don't know if you want to comment on that, just, you know, growing up as a Seventh-day Adventist and being, because my family had been out of the yeah. church, but this, this idea of the time of trouble, striking fear to the hearts, in fact, you know, some of the mindset that I've gotten from people that they've is, is that, uh, you know, the time of trouble is one of those times that I'm going to try to be a good Christian and I'm focusing on Christ and all that. But, but no matter how faithful I am, the time of trouble may just shake me loose. Mm. Yeah, I can remember as a kid thinking like every time you see one of those special bulletins come on the TV, I was expecting one of them to be like, uh, Washington, D.C., they just passed the Sunday law and we're going to be running for the hills. Like it would, ha and we, we know that the final events will be rapid ones, which yeah, by the way, didn't have how, all that. how much has changed in the last one or two weeks? Oh, absolutely. I mean, can the final events be rapid? We, you know, oh, it's yes. easy to put our security in the economy or the military or our, just our history as a government. Everything's going to be fine. It's too big of a ship to turn that quick. But let me tell you, we have seen witness once again that, and I'm not saying that this crisis is the great final crisis, right. but it definitely reveals that quick events can happen in this earth even today. That's right. And people are willing to give up a lot of liberties very quickly yes, when their security is threatened. That's right. We kind of launched into that because we're talking about this time of trouble. Right, and the time of trouble that's mentioned here, it says it will be a time such as never was since there was a nation. So it's not just a time of trouble. This is the most intense time of trouble the world has ever witnessed. And no wonder if it stopped right there, that would be inherently terrifying. That's right. But, but praise the Lord, the passage doesn't end there. It says what next? And at that, at that time, time, what will happen? Your, your people, people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. Yeah, and you know, this reminds me of Jeremiah 30. Now, Jeremiah talks about the time of trouble, specifically calls it the time of Jacob's trouble, which I believe this is, this is, you know, the Bible talks about a, a few times of trouble. One being the time of trouble in the general sense that the world is in chaos. And then the time of Jacob's trouble happens in that context. We're not going to get into all that, the, the nuances of that now. But in Jeremiah chapter 30, and uh, I want to say, yeah, I want to say verse verse 7. 
Um, and in fact, uh, verse 6, Jeremiah says, Jeremiah 30, verse 6, ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with child, right? What kind of question is that? You know, and, but notice why he asks the question. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor and all faces turn pale? It's a you know, it's miserable like if a man picture. hasn't been in yeah. labor, why does he look like he's going through labor pains? Mm. That's his question. And then he says, alas, for that day is great so that none is like it. Very similar to what we just read in, right. in Daniel. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble. And if that's where this verse ended, it would be miserable, like that's you right. said. But he, not might be, he shall be saved out of it. Amen. So here and also in Daniel, uh, it's going to be a difficult time, but God's people will be saved. And something else I was wanting to highlight is, Michael has stood up. We're looking at the close of human probation at this time. Mm -hmm. Every case has been decided. Nobody's going to lose their experience in the time of trouble. Mercy. Every case has been decided. The time of trouble is not going to shake somebody loose. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. And, and taking from this passage and what we just read in Daniel, God's people are going to be delivered in this time. And you know this is actually prefigured in the narratives of Daniel. If you go to Daniel chapter 3, at least you can think back to it. We know yeah. the story well. Daniel's three friends are faced with a literal life and death choice between who are you going to worship and serve, right? This image that the beast, or I'm sorry, <laughs> the king has set up That's right. versus the true worship of God. And I love how they don't equivocate in that moment that even though there's literal life on the line, they've got the fiery furnace sitting right there as a death threat hanging over them. And they said, we have no need to answer you in regard to this. Right. And what do they do? They go into the fiery furnace and what does the king see? One like the son of man. He delivers them out of that. Amen. So every image we see of this time of trouble is yes, that it's awful, but that God's people will be delivered. And you make a good point. A lot of people think the only way to deliverance is to be delivered from, from the trouble. trouble. Right. But God has repeatedly delivered people in the midst of trouble. Amen. Amen. Whether it's a storm on the sea or a fiery furnace or you name it, the exactly. Lord is able to deliver. And so that's powerful news here Amen. as we're looking at this. And now it's interesting. We're talking about the people at this time of trouble, people who are living at that time and what have you. But then verse 2 says, and many of those who... Sleep. Sleep in the dust. So there's a deliverance for those who are living, but also for those who are dead. Right. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So this is pointing forward to the resurrection of the dead, but there's something different yes. about this, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, if you look at verse 2, it, it obviously is talking about a resurrection, but I'm not sure it's talking about the resurrection in the general sense of the term, right? Now, why would you say that? Well, there's a couple of indicators here. First of all, the big one in my mind is it doesn't say, and all who sleep in the dust, right? Right. Because there, Jesus has talked about how all would hear his voice, all the righteous, and then right. later all the wicked. We looked but, at one of those passages already. Right, we and we understand as we look at Scripture, especially in John chapter 5 and other places, that the resurrection will happen in two phases. When Christ comes again, the resurrection of the righteous, and at the end of the thousand years, the resurrection of the wicked, right? right. But this is not talking about that. First of all, it's not talking about all, it's just many, so mm -hmm. a certain group. And notice it's a mixed crowd, if you will, right? That's right. Some at this resurrection will, to, will be raised to everlasting life, while some will be raised to shame and everlasting contempt. So there's both righteous and wicked, and it, so it's not a general mm -hmm. resurrection of all the righteous and then a general resurrection of all the wicked. It's a special resurrection that includes both righteous and wicked. Mm -hmm. Now that's an interesting thing. It's, it's unique in the well, resurrection and, and, experience. And if somebody maybe questioned that, mm -hmm. this, this really answers a verse that oftentimes seems to be overlooked and that's Revelation 1-7 that says mm -hmm. that when Jesus comes, every eye will see him and those who pierced him. Now this yes. is speaking of a second coming, not a thousand years later, right. with the general resurrection of the wicked. So those who pierced him are not going to be raised, well they will be raised at the general resurrection of the wicked, but there's but a special resurrection. They have the privilege of being raised prior to that right. to watch Jesus come in the clouds of glory. Every, right. There's yeah. this promise that was given. When Jesus was standing before his, uh, his, right. his tribunal, he made that declaration. You're going to see me come again. Revelation talks about it, even those who pierce him. And here we have in Daniel chapter 12, when it talks about the coming of Jesus for the first time, right? Because he's been, That's Michael's right. just standing up. Mm -hmm. He's about to enter into the world as king instead of judge. And at that time, it says, many who sleep in the dust, that is, many from the dead will be raised, some to everlasting life, that right. is the righteous, right? But then some 
shame and everlasting contempt. So this seems to be a clear indication when you put other scriptures together of a special resurrection at the second coming of Jesus for the wicked who pierced Christ and, and, and Mrs. Mm -hmm. White, I believe, goes on to say some of the fiercest enemies of righteousness yeah. will have the opportunity to see the truth when Jesus comes again in his full glory. That's what right. a powerful thought, yeah. That's right. Another reference verse that, uh, and, and there's a good uh, reference in Great Controversy, page 6, 637, talking about the special resurrection. But another verse that goes along with this is Revelation 14, where it talks about those who give the last message prior to Christ's coming. And then it says, blessed are those who, who die, die in the Lord from, from this time on. forward. Yeah. What is that talking about? Those who have a part in preparing the world for the coming of Christ, I believe are going to have a part right. in a special resurrection. So like there's a, there's a group of the wicked who've been promised to see Christ That's come. Right. And there's a group of the righteous who've been promised to see that That's glorious right. coming. Fascinating. That's right. Now we move on to, uh, if we're looking at verse 4, it says, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So we've used this before, uh, and I, th I don't think inappropriately that knowledge increasing, talking about the advances in uh, technology, I mean the fact that uh, if you would tell anybody you could motion picture, what motion pictures, it was about 1880s, I think, that yeah. they, they even the first you know, just a couple hundred years ago sure. in, a, in a span of history. Anyway. Well, in aerospace and going to the moon, I mean, all kinds of stuff. We could talk but. About, but, the, but the primary application yes, in sir. the original uh, language is that running to and fro, it, comparing truth scripture with Scripture truth, with Scripture, scripture with line scripture upon line, coming, precept, right. And coming into a deeper knowledge of the truth. And what the Bible's saying is that, Daniel, your book... The prophecies we're studying here is going to be sealed up until the time of the end. And at that time, there's going to be an increase mm -hmm. in the understanding and the study and understanding of prophecy. Right. That now increase wasn't for Daniel mm -hmm. because as Daniel comes through this in verse 8, he says, Although I heard, I did not understand. Mm -hmm. Then I said, My Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, <laughs> Go your way, Daniel. You're not going to understand, which right. has its level of frustration, but seal uh, the, the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. But in verse 10, it closes, but the wise shall understand. That's exactly so right. So that's not saying that Daniel isn't wise or isn't pure, but right. he just wasn't living in the time of the unsealing, right? Right. And so what's fascinating is when you go through the book of Daniel, clearly the stories of Daniel have been understood for centuries. So have many of the prophecies of Daniel, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, and a lot of the elements of it. But when it comes past a certain point, there's been a blockage of understanding until very relatively, uh, given the history of the world, recently. And it's interesting that it's by design. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we can assume that uh, a person doesn't understand, they're just not, oh, you're not getting it, you need to work harder at it, whatever else. But this is in the design of God. Yes, it is. That this is sealed up for now. And he tells Daniel so, and he tells us so until the time of the end. Now, when is the time of the end? Well, the good thing is Daniel seems to have that question. I mean, if God said, this is going to be closed until a particular time, wouldn't it be logical to ask, well, when is that time? That's, right? And if you look there in verse 7, uh, after, well, after Daniel in verse 6 asks, yes. how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Actually, it says, and one said to the man clothed in linen. Sure, that's true. It, it, but the question is asked in this chapter, Right Daniel's after probably he's, so dumbfounded, he's like, I don't know what right, to ask. And, and right. the holy being says, here, I'll you know, this ask is what you, I know this is what you mean, right? <laughs> he asks, right? And the answer given him uh, in the middle of verse 7, that it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. Now that and, should ring a bell for anybody who's been studying Daniel. Exactly. Now, again, we're at the very end of this series of studies, and we've gone chapter 2, chapter 7 especially has yes. highlighted that. Daniel chapter 8 has talked about this. And that there's this, there are time prophecies that have been re re mentioned already. And once again, this is not the first time we've seen time, times, and half a time. No. In fact, this is the most often quoted, often referenced time prophecy in all of Scripture. Seven different times, both in the book of Daniel and in Revelation, you Sometimes see... Sometimes it's time, times, and half a time. Exactly. Sometimes 42 months. Sometimes 1,260 days, right. but they all shake out are to the same, same period. literal period of time of 1,260 years. And as we've Which established, began. exactly, in previous lessons, we've established that that began in 538 AD when the papacy came to not just have a spiritual power, but civil power right. in earth, it just like any other ruler in the mm -hmm. sequence of beasts. But then in 1798, it had that power removed 
uh, received a deadly wound, as the book of Revelation would call it. So that 1,260 year period came to a close in 1798. So up until 1798, you could understand certain aspects of Daniel's stories and all of his prophecies that led up to, but that time of the end, that Michael standing up, that intercession of Christ as the heavenly sanctuary priest, high priest, that was, that was not understood by Christians of sincere faith, even Daniel himself, mm -hmm. until an appointed time. It's as though God put his hand over that and said, no, not for you, you can have this much, but not this far. But that after that time, he began to remove his hand and light came to the mm -hmm. world and you had wonderful Bible studying it Bible students. It gave birth to the great Second Advent movement exactly. because there was a renewed interest in the study of prophecy. There was a renewed understanding in prophecy. That's right. And the parallel to Revelation chapter 10, where you had the eating of the scroll and that experience mm -hmm. that it's rich, but it had yes. a great disappointment, but prophesy again. There would be a renewal of this, what Daniel referred to here as the knowledge shall increase. Knowledge began to increase at the time when God said it would. That's right. And of course, Daniel didn't understand. He's told to go his way. And in verse 10, he's told, many shall be purified, made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. I'm going to come back to the wise in a minute, like I said, but uh, I want to touch on this being purified, made white and refined. Mm -hmm. Throughout scripture, nobody's made white. Nobody's purified by easy times. Mm. <laughs> it's always trials. It's always hard times. And some of the most faithful of God's people have been through the hardest times. Mm. Uh, I was just reading this morning <laughs> about Isaiah and the death of his wife, you know, where God had told him, hey, you're going to, and don't mourn over it and everything. <laughs> and, you know, anyway, it, it would be great to say, oh, a follower of God never has to have any more sorrow in their life. But that's, mm. it's been the opposite. And the only reason the only legitimate explanation, and scripture gives it, is that God is allowing those things to work out his character in his people. Mm. There's a purpose being fulfilled. And any one of us knows if we've gone through hard times, nobody would choose them. But nobody can honestly say that they didn't work a refinement of our characters. Well, even the Lord himself, in, in his earthly experience, right? The Bible tells us yes. that the captain of our salvation was made perfect through, through suffering. suffering. Now that's not to say he was imperfect and became pure, but there's a broadening and deepening establishing of that character that needed to happen. Yes. And it could only happen through the fires of persecution and trouble. That's right. And so the, to see people that God's- People tried to kill him, throw him over hills. People right. rejected, his own people rejected him. He was like- right. He was, was a man of sorrows. Yes. You know, he, the Bible tells us all of these things about him, but what came out of that was the, 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 the only savior we could have. It, it, right. it was necessary for our salvation that Christ would go through that and he expects his character to be reproduced and, and, in his people. And then it's, the Bible says, and you were quoting from Hebrews where it says, mm -hmm. you know, he was made perfect through suffering. Uh, he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all of one. That's in right. In other words, that, that suffering enables him to lead us through yeah. the suffering of this life. And the reason I bring it up is this crisis we're in the middle of, there's nobody who is, who is not touched now by mm -hmm. this pandemic. And it has rattled a lot of people, even yes. good Christian people with, with uncertainty. It, 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 we we want to know what is exactly going to happen tomorrow and we get news reports. But the point is that God is not surprised by these things. Uh, in fact, he's foretold the coming of famines and pestilences and what have you. It's not his will that we suffer pain, but he uses, he permits it because he uses it for good to refine our characters, to make mm. them more like Jesus. And so, yeah. again, we're, we're in the middle of this thing. Don't allow it to shake your confidence in the Lord. He is in full control and he will work his purposes out. Mm. You know, the Apostle Paul speaks of the far greater weight of glory. That's that right. will be, But it will be produced in us through those trials that we have to go through. So we should look at these as an opportunity to praise the Lord for another opportunity to become more like him in his character. Right. And so God tells Daniel here that there's going to be a refinement process, but he also promises that the wise shall understand. We're not going to be clueless. We're going to understand things about the truth that we couldn't otherwise. We're going to understand because of the things we've passed through, uh, things about God, things about his message that we couldn't otherwise. Well, and we also, I, I want to make sure to highlight this point that we talk about that purification process, that it's not like, it, it says they're going to be made white. They didn't say become white through their own works or something, but God is working in us this thing. And that's what, you know, sometimes I think we get the picture that God is simply 
a kind of aloof and standing back as he right. flips through the judgment page. Oh, this one is in and this one is out. But he's not just looking and calling balls and strikes and saying, That's this is right. a good one. He actually is vested in his people. He sends his Holy Spirit to work out that salvation in us. And so his goal is to be the purifier, the refiner of that character, that the builder up of his own kingdom. So that when, Christ, you know, it's Christ who works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's and right. And I think that Sometimes we talk about these end time events or well, even Christ. Well, you just Christ. mentioned that the, the Furbage, the captain of our salvation, yeah. that doesn't picture somebody far off. Right. That's somebody who's right there with us, working yes. with us and in, in, in guaranteeing our success. And when we think of the work of judgment that Christ is doing right now, we can think of it in kind of almost cold or callous terms, like up, yeah. oh, good one, bad one, yeah. in and out, where the reality is he's trying, I mean, Peter talks about this. He's not willing right, to There's a big should, needle and a buzzer. Right. Yeah, and you're in and out. No, no, no. But he's trying to build out of us, bring out of us by his grace and his strength, people who can stand right. and can be safe to save for all eternity. He wants a full kingdom full of citizens who want to be there. And, and this is the work of God in this time is not only to sift out the bad from the good, but to make bad into good. That's he right. wants to turn us into people like and, himself. And Paul, in, when he talks about Christ's priestly work, says it is, it is our hope is with... It, you know, that, that it anchors in yes. what Jesus is doing behind the veil. Amen. So it's what Christ has promised to do and continues to do in and for and through us that is the anchor of our soul. Amen. Amen. Well, Daniel is told that there's going to be a refinement process. Um, and then we get into the last few verses here. It says, And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. But you go your way to the end, for you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of the days. Now, There's a lot I there. hate to say it here, but when we get, sometimes we get into these dates in prophecy. Mm. Some Adventists yes, sir. get in order to make everything relevant, it can't have been fulfilled in the past. Mm -hmm. It has to be some kind of future. 1335, I've seen people try to map this out. This must be pointing to the second coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. No. And I think the lesson did a great yes, job yes, with, with these, these time periods. But why don't you tell us a little bit about the 1290 and the 1335? We already have sure. the time, times, and half a time, which applies as well. Well, that's an important point. We already have the time, times, and half a time. And yes. that prophecy was mentioned more than any other prophecy. It's the anchor point of these, you know, to put these in context. And yes. sometimes we get in trouble. We'll lift maybe that one passage out, two passages out, yeah. and completely take it away from its context and start looking for news headlines that apply. Yeah. And it's got to start now or the World Trade Center or this the virus yeah. or what. And the reality is that God never intended Bible prophecy to be separated out of its context and applied willy-nilly as we mm -hmm. feel or sense it from our perspective. That he gives us, and he started it with Daniel 2, a framework that it all fits inside of. Babylon, then Medo-Persia, then Greece, then Rome, and then he breaks it down. Daniel 7 gives more detail, but it's the yes. same framework. Daniel 8, 9, 10, and onward does right. the same thing. And this Daniel chapter 12, of course, is coming right off the heels of Daniel 11, where it repeated that same sequence. And in fact, inside of Daniel chapter 12, the Lord himself just referred to the time of the end being from time, times, and half a time. Mm -hmm. And we know that that goes to 1798, That's right? right? So what we should look to do is see how do these prophecies, the, seven, uh, the 1290 and the 1335, connect to the framework that the Lord has already established. Instead right. of saying, well, this has got to be something completely distinct and off. No, we're another looking for connection. Well, another important point is, from the time, it says from verse 11, from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the mm -hmm. abomination of desolation is set up, these are terms that have been brought up in Daniel yes, previously. Have. And yes. so uh, if you haven't studied in chapter <laughs> 7 and 8 yeah. and 9 and, you know, in, in, in chapter 11, which bring up pieces of this terminology, then you're not going to be able to put this together. Exactly. But we understand from the previous chapters that chapters rather that the, the daily sacrifice had reference to the priestly ministry, the heavenly high priestly ministry of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that the taking away of that in the establishing of the abomination, one is taken away to establish the other. The abomination of desolation, uh, this phrase is used throughout scripture to talk about false systems of worship. Mm -hmm. And what Daniel's already predicted is that the ministry of Christ was going to be supplanted 
mm -hmm. by another system of worship. And we've seen that through the Dark Ages and the establishment of the papacy, that there's an earthly priesthood mm -hmm. that is set up in place of Christ's heavenly priesthood to the point that many people to this day, many good Christians, don't know hardly a thing about Christ's work in the heavenly That's sanctuary. Right. We have a high priest that That's no right. one's looking to because an earthly priest has taken the place in many, many people's lives. And the lives. Bible points us, it says, to the time that the daily was taken away and the abomination set up. That system of papal rule, now we mm -hmm. start, the 1798 began with 538 mm -hmm. because in 538, the, the, the civil and religious powers united in right. Rome uh, it, it, it officially, right. but what a lot of people don't understand is that with Clovis, the king of the Franks, one of the one of the divisions, those ten mm -hmm. divisions of of you know the ten toes and right. ten, ten horns, tribes, that, you know, that Clovis, the king of the Franks, was a, a, a Catholic man who united church and state mm -hmm. in his rule, paving the way. For, for the broader rule that he would have. For the papacy yeah. sitting, uh, uh, taking its place, its role in 538. His, right. his taking the throne in 508, if that had not happened, 538 wouldn't have happened. So the t 1,260 days or years has the same end point in 1798 as the 1,290 days or years, right? Right. But the difference is one starts in 538 AD and the other one starts with the precursor work, the preparatory work of Clovis in 508 AD, when for the first time, civil power was given into the papal, the spiritual power's hands, right? That's right. And so that's, these two are complementary. They work together. Then, if you move on... Well, before you okay. read that, I just wanted to highlight, the sure. lesson brings this out. Thursday's lesson puts it this way. It says, thus, this prophetic period... The 1290 should start in A.D. 508 when Clovis, king of the Franks, converted to the Catholic faith. This important event paved the way for the union between church and state, which held sway through the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was a king, so you have the state there. When he converted, then, then uh, uh, you know, that again paved the way for the uniting of the two uh, through his reign and the establishment of the papal power. All right, so we've seen the 1,260 days, and we've seen the 1,290 days, both right. have a common terminus at 1798, but the, 13, uh, the 1,290 days actually starts earlier in 508. That's right. When Clovis gives the civil authority to the spiritual power uh, and the papacy. And it has a special time. way of confirming, and we're gonna see this with the 1335 from, from both ways, yes. and you understand this in a moment, yeah. confirming this, this period of 538 to 1798, as uh -huh. well as the transition of the ministry of Christ uh, with the 2300 day prophecy. Well, exactly right, because now look at verse 12. It says, blessed is he who waits, right? So there's mm -hmm. clearly another time period here, and it tells us what it is, and comes to the 1,335 days. Now, in the immediate context of 12 was 11, which we just read, which is the 1,290 day prophecy, which begins in 508. So then if you could take 1,335 years later, mm -hmm. you come to the year 1843. That's right. Now, what I think is fascinating is that 1,260 day prophecy is mentioned in Daniel chapter seven, and the 2,300 year prophecy that ends in 1844 is mentioned in Daniel chapter eight. And that's if right. that's all you had, you would almost think they were kind of separate. But here, in the very closing passages of Daniel, it brings them and shows a connectivity, a yes. connection of those two prophecies. Now, Mark, why would it be, what, what is your take on why would one go to 1843 and the other go to 1844? They're so close. Yeah, I, I wrestled with that for the longest time, perhaps uh, you have as well, that, you know, we know that the 2300 day prophecy came to its end in 1844 when Christ transitioned into the last phase of his ministry mm -hmm. preparatory to a second coming, right? Uh, in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. But, um, you know, I, and I wondered why here, would it come to, shouldn't it come to 1844? Am I yeah. doing the math wrong? Um, and this ties into the last thing that I've been holding off for, and that is if we go back to verse 3, and this is our memory verse, by the way, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This is a Hebrew parallelism. In other words, you've got parallel thoughts here. Notice, um, those who are wise is a parallel to those who turn many to righteousness. And shining like the brightness of the firmament is a parallel to shining like the stars forever and ever. You see that? Mm -hmm. 
And so, in other words, those who are wise are the same ones who are turning many to righteousness. Yes, it is. And it makes me think of what it says in, in, in Proverbs 11, where it says, he who wins souls is wise. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the, the end of the chapter, it, Daniel, you know, the wicked will not understand, but the wise shall understand. The wise are the ones who win souls. The wise are the ones who turn many to righteousness. And I think as we go through this, it, 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 back to your question, why 1843 instead of 1844? Because in 1844 came what we call the Great Disappointment. And um, as much as there was a message to give, there had been a movement proclaiming yes. uh, and, and this, this great event in prophecy. And those who came to 1844, if that's the first time they come to any knowledge of it, they missed it. That's they right. missed the proclamation part. Yes. But those who came to 1843, blessed is he, says mm -hmm. who waits and comes to the 1,335, he would have been part of that movement of proclamation. Mm -hmm. And in the same way in these last days, God has a message to be proclaimed, a message that's going to turn many to righteousness. And there's the, jo the joy of the wise mm. is turning, the righteous, turning many to righteousness into the way of salvation through Jesus Christ. Oh, mercy. There's, there's so much here I want to preach. We only have a few <laughs> minutes left, but let me tell you, what I find fascinating is, well, two things. Number one, yes. there's a direct parallel here to Revelation chapter 10, where the prophet is given this scroll to eat, which is That's the right. opened book of the prophecies of Daniel that now can be understood, and he digests it and he takes it in. But there was a part of it that was still misunderstood, and they proclaimed it, but there was a great disappointment. That's right. But then he was told to prophesy again. That's right. So the joy was not only the eating of it, but also the proclaiming of it that That's made right. the disappointment so great. It was so great because so many people knew about well, it. Well, and that was it. the sweetness in the mouth. And That's then right. In, in Revelation uh, 10, it said it would be sweet in your mouth and bitter in the stomach. You had the disappointment, but it was a sweet was a experience sweetness. of proclaiming, yes. and that sweetness was going to come again when he prophesied again. Exactly. And the closing chapter of Daniel here talks about mm. the, the wise not only will understand, but they will turn many to righteousness. That's right. Just like the closing chapter of the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 22 yes. and verse 17. You know, it says here, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears, and the Bible does not say, let him who hears come. Yeah. Even though most people think that's what it that's says. That's right. That's not what it says. It says, let him who hears say, say come. come. Give the invitation to someone else. That's right. What, what, did the spirit, what does it mean, they say, the Spirit and the Bride say come? When you say come, you're inviting somebody. It's an you're giving an invitation. Yes. And so it says, the Spirit, Holy Spirit, the, the Bride, the Church, mm -hmm. this is interesting, say come. They're making an invitation. But every new person who comes into the church, every person who hears that invitation, receives it, is to say, yes. come, is to repeat the same yes. invitation. And if you notice, to turn the, many to righteous. <laughs> the Spirit is the Holy Spirit of God, right? Yes. He's working for people's salvation. The church collectively, the bride is working, but then it goes individual. Let him, That's individual right. person, say, come. So there is a call to not only general proclamation of the whole movement, of the whole church, of God's agents and mm -hmm. angels. He's looking for individual messengers of salvation to turn many to righteousness at this time. If there was ever a call to personal ministry, it is That's at this time right. by every member of the church. And I'm going to say, and I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet, maybe mm. there needs to be a little disclaimer on the bottom of the screen. <laughs> we'll be this sure to put an asterisk down endorsing there. the Michigan Conference official, yeah. whatever. But I don't think this COVID-19 thing is the end. Mm. It's a piece of the end. It's been foretold, famines, pestilences, wars, mm -hmm. and what have you. But there's a message to be given and to be proclaimed yes. with a loud cry. And right now, proclamation, I mean, we can't even meet as churches. And I'm not saying there aren't we challenges similar to that. But, but there is going to be an opening up of this world in a way. And I think things like this are making people search their hearts mm -hmm. that are preparing the way. And listen, when this passes, which I believe it will, at least momentarily, it will be time for God's people like never before to mm -hmm. proclaim this message to the world mm -hmm. uh, to turn many into righteousness. Amen. You know, a lot of times we're reflecting right now about, well, what even is the church? If we can't meet in worship services, That's I guess right. we're done with church. The no. church is not just a building and it's not just the worship service on the seventh day Sabbath and all the wonderful things that it That's provides, right. but it is supposed to be uh, the conduit by which we can be trained and encouraged and deployed as missionary agents for God. So that if the church were to close down, if it weren't to meet, 
your Christian experience isn't done. That's you right. still have a work to do for the Lord. And friends, I want to appeal to you today, just as the Lord through Daniel and through the, John mm. in the book of Revelation, and as we close this study of Bible prophecy, please don't let it be just trivial pursuit or an academic you know, uh, interest that we've peaked here or some sort of like intellectual something or another. It's not just theory. The Bible right. wasn't written just for you know, philosophy. It wasn't just theology. It's supposed to be practical daily living. And the Lord expects each one of us to not only accept this message, but to transmit it to others, to not only receive it for ourselves, but to say to others, come, to be part of this great final event, final That's movement right. that God wants to have. Michael's about to stand up. Amen. Human probation is about to close. Now is the time where Jesus works on our behalf. Now mm. is the time the proclamation of that message was pointing forward to the work of Jesus Amen. to save every soul. And, and he's still working to do that very thing now. And there are multitudes who don't know it. Amen. And they need to know it. Friends, we hope you've enjoyed this Sabbath School presentation. I can tell you I've enjoyed. I can speak for mm -hmm. Pastor Power Howard probably as well, that we've had a wonderful experience here. And we hope that your daily experience in the Lord and His Word is just as fervent as it is on the Sabbath day. And when you have the opportunity to come together in your Sabbath School groups again, mm -hmm. to make those rich connections and let it truly be a blessing for everyone who's here. Pastor Howard, as we dismiss today, would you give us a word of prayer? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the word of truth and the confidence we can have in it. Lord, even in the uncertainty we see in our world today, uh, we know that your word stands forever. And Father, may we take comfort knowing that you are in control, that Michael, our prince, stands for his people and he will bring deliverance to everyone. Lord, may we not just uh, and enjoy the privilege of that deliverance for ourselves. But may it motivate us to reach out to others who have not yet experienced Christ. Mm -hmm. Lord, send your spirit into our hearts that we may proclaim your message with no uncertainty to the world around us, that we may turn many, many to righteousness by your grace. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.